Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and yes, indeed, I shall be your reader again today. In 2004, two very clever and creative writers, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, penned a children's novel that was published by Hyperion Books, which is a subsidiary of Disney. And being a subsidiary of Disney, you might expect it to have that flavor. The story in the children's book is a reimagining or a reinterpretation or even a reboot of a story first imagined by a Scottish novelist and playwright in his 1902 adult novel called The Little White Bird. Now the tale is about an ageless boy and an ordinary girl who have adventures in the fantasy setting of Neverland. Sir James Matthew Barry, first baronet, 1860 to 1937, was more well known as J. M. Barry, the creator of Peter Pan. Parenthetically, before his death, Baronet Barry, <laughs> double B there, honored, uh, uh, honored so by King George V in June of 1913, gave the rights to the Peter Pan works to Great Ormond Street Hospital of Children in London, which continues to this day to benefit from them. But back to Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson in 2004. In their restyling of the Peter Pan story, the authors of Peter and the Star Catchers weaves a, day, a tale that is often thought to be a prequel to the classic story as envisioned by J.M. Barry. In their story, a young 13-year-old orphan, so long an orphan that he has forgotten his name, sets sail with two other orphan boys as prisoners aboard a merchant ship, the Neverland, a journey to a town, a place called Rondoon, which quickly becomes fraught with excitement and danger. Just to fast forward a bit, a play with music was adapted from the Barry Pearson book and debuted in 2009 at the La Jolla Playhouse as part of an arrangement with Disney Theatrical. It was restaged off Broadway in 2011 and opened on Broadway in 2012, where it reached a high level of success and played to appreciative audiences for two years. From that Broadway script, I quote these lines from the orphan who, by the end of the play, becomes Peter Pan. Quote, there's dark, a mass of darkness in the world. And if you get trapped in that cave, it beats you down. Sorry, can't fix it. Better to say nothing than sorry. I relate the story of Peter and the Star Catcher to today's featured book, where orphan and darkness become significantly operative words, although the outcomes of their lives are so significantly different. One magical, the other tragic. In 2016, author Colson Whitehead won both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award with his book, 
the Underground Railroad, which was also a number one New York Times bestseller. Three years later, in 2019, Whitehead again jolted the modern literature world with a second book winning the Pulitzer for fiction a book that brilliantly dramatizes another strand of American history through the story of two orphan boys sentenced to the hellish darkness of a reform school in Jim Crow era Florida. The Nickel Boys is the name of that book and it is our featured novel in the spotlight for today's reading. But before exploring the story told, let us consider some facts about the author. Colson Whitehead. Arch Colson Chip Whitehead was born in New York City in late 1969 and lived his formative years in Manhattan, where he attended the highly selective independent Trinity School on the Upper West Side. As a child, Whitehead went by his first name, Arch, later switching to Chip before a final switch to Colson. He graduated from Harvard University in 1991 and began drafting his first novels while writing for The Village Voice. He was the recipient of both a MacArthur and a Guggenheim Fellowship early in his career. Whitehead has since produced 10 books, eight novels, and two nonfiction works, including a meditation on life in Manhattan in the style of E.B. White's famous essay, Here is New York. His essays and his reviews have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times, uh, The New Yorker, Granta, and Harper's. In writing about Whitehead, the New Yorker has used the words ambitious, scintillating, and strikingly original. Whitehead has taught at Princeton University, New York University, the University of Houston, Columbia University, Brooklyn College, Hunter College, and Wesleyan University. He has also been a writer in residence at Vassar College, the University of Richmond, and the University of Wyoming. Finally, in 2020, Arch Colson Chip Whitehead was honored with the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. The Nickel Boys, the book. At a brief 210 pages, the Nickel Boys packs a significant wallop like in the Underground Railroad, there are scenes in the Nickel Boys that are especially difficult to read and harder still to comprehend and process from the 1960s America. Although a work of fiction, the novel was inspired by the real life story of the Dozier School for Boys in Florida that operated for 111 years, where children convicted of minor incidents and offenses suffered violent abuse, warping the minds and lives of thousands of boys, both the white and the African-American. As the civil rights movement begins to reach the black enclave of Frenchtown in segregated Tallahassee, Elwood Curtis takes the words of Dr. Martin Luther King to heart. He is as good as anyone. 
abandoned by his parents, but kept on the straight and narrow by his grandmother, Elwood is a star high school student about to start classes at a local college. But for a black boy in the Jim Crow South of the early 1960s, one innocent mistake of being in the wrong place at the wrong time is enough to destroy the future. Elwood is sentenced to a juvenile reformatory called the Nickel Academy, whose mission statement says it provides, quote, physical, intellectual, and moral training, end quote, so that the delinquent boys in their charge can become, quote, honorable and honest. In reality, the Nickel Academy is a grotesque chamber of horrors where the sadistic staff beats and sexually abuses the students, corrupt officials and locals steal food and supplies, and any boy who resists is likely to disappear out back. There were four ways of leaving the Nickel Academy other than by graduating from your sentence term. The results of the choice Elwood made is the final twist in the eager journey to the final chapter of the book. Let me share this quote with you. Throw us in jail and we will still love you. But be assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer. And one day we will win our freedom. You may recognize that quote from a very famous man. Indeed, Elwood Curtis contemplates these words of Martin Luther King Jr. often through the long, hard, damaging days and nights at the Nickel Academy. Before I begin reading, I would just like to make a comment that some of the words used in the book by the author may be offensive to you. I certainly, as always, will edit some words, uh, but the word starting with N that we find so offensive today and has been for many years, the word nigger is used by the author um, as a, an African-American author, um, and it comes up very frequently. Remember, we are in the 1960s when the book begins, so I just want to comment on that. Uh, in case that is bothersome for you, which I assume it might be. I'm going to start with chapter one. I am uh, going to uh, do a little skipping around only so that I can come back at the end and do the prologue. Um, I, if I read the prologue now, it's going to, I think, uh, oddly spoil the story. So I'm going to begin at chapter one, so we get accustomed to uh, the style of the writer and also the setting of the protagonist. Uh, and then we'll skip to another chapter to find out how he ends up at the Nichols School. Uh, and then yet another one uh, that's very important. And then we'll go to the follow-up prologue, not an epilogue, but a prologue. So I begin with chapter one of the book. Elwood received the best gift of his life on Christmas day, 1962, even if the ideas it put in his head were his undoing. Martin Luther King at Zion Hill was the only album he owned and he never left the turntable. His grandmother Harriet had a few gospel records, which she only played when the world discovered a new mean way to work on her. And Elwood wasn't allowed to listen to the Motown groups or popular songs like that on account of their licentious nature. The rest of his presents that year were clothes, a new red sweater, socks, 
and he certainly wore those out, but nothing endured such good and constant use as the record. Every scratch and pulpit gathered over the months was a mark of his enlightenment, trapping each time he entered into a new understanding of the reverend's words, the crackle of truth. They didn't have a TV set, but Dr. King's speeches were such a vivid chronicle containing all that the Negro had been and all that he would be, that the record was almost as good as television, maybe even better, grander, like the towering screen at the Davis drive-in, which he'd been to twice. Al Woods saw it all, Africans persecuted by the white sin of slavery, Negroes humiliated and kept low by segregation, and that luminous image to come when all those places closed to his race were opened. The speeches had been recorded all over, Detroit and Charlotte and Montgomery, connecting Elwood to the rights struggle across the country. One speech even made him feel like a member of the King family. Every kid had heard of Funtown, been there or envied someone who had. In the third cut of side A, Dr. King spoke of how his daughter longed to visit the amusement park on Stewart Avenue in Atlanta. Yolanda begged her parents whenever she spotted the big sign from the expressway or the commercials came on TV. Dr. King had to tell her in his low, sad rumble about the segregation system that kept colored boys and girls on the other side of the fence. Explain the misguided thinking of some whites, not all whites, but enough whites, that gave it force and meaning. He counseled his daughter to resist the lure of hatred and bitterness and assured her that, quote, even though you can't go to Funtown, I want you to know that you are as good as anybody who goes into Funtown. That was Elwood, as good as anyone. 230 miles south of Atlanta in Tallahassee. Sometimes he saw a fun town commercial while visiting his cousins in Georgia. Lurching rides and happy music, chipper white kids lining up for the wild mouse roller coaster, Dick's mini golf, strap into the atomic rocket for a trip to the moon. A perfect report card guaranteed free admission, the commercial said, if your teacher stamped a red mark on it. Elwood got all A's and kept his stack of evidence for that day they opened Funtown to all God's children, as Dr. King promised. Quote, I'll get in free every day for a month, easy. He told his grandmother lying on the front room rug and tracing a threadbare patch with his thumb. His grandmother Harriet had rescued the rug from the alley behind the Richmond Hotel after the last renovation. The bureau in her room, the tiny table next to Elwood's bed, the three lamps were also Richmond castoffs. Harriet had worked at the hotel since she was 14 when she had joined her mother on the cleaning staff. Once Elwood entered high school, the hotel manager, Mr. Parker, made it clear he'd hire him as a porter whenever he wanted. Smart kid like him. And the white man was disappointed when the boy be began working at Marconi's Tobacco and Cigars. Mr. Parker was always kind to the family, even after he had to fire Elwood's mother for stealing. Elwood liked the Richmond, and he liked Mr. Parker, <clears throat> but adding a fourth generation to the hotel's accounts made him uneasy in a way he found difficult to describe, even before the encyclopedias. When he was hunger, younger, he sat on a crate in the hotel kitchen after school reading comic books and Hardy Boys while his grandmother straightened and scrubbed upstairs. With both his parents gone, 
She preferred to have her nine-year-old grandson nearby instead of alone in the house. Seeing Elwood with the kitchen men made her think those afternoons were a kind of school in their own right, that it was good for him to be around men. The cooks and waiters took the boy for a mascot, playing hide and seek with him and peddling creaky wisdom on various topics, the white man's ways, how to treat a good time gal, strategies for hiding money around the house. Elwood didn't understand what the older men talked about most of the time, but he nodded gamely before returning to his adventure stories. After rushes, Elwood sometimes challenged the dishwashers to plate drying races that made a good natured show of being disappointed by his superior skills. They liked seeing his smile and his odd delight at each win. Then the staff turned over. The new downtown hotels poached personnel. Cooks came and went. <clears throat> a few of the waiters didn't return after the kitchen reopened from flood damage. With the change in staff, Elwood's races changed from endearing novelty to mean-spirited hustle. The latest dishwashers were tipped off that the grandson of one of the cleaning girls did your work for you if you told him it was a game. Keep on the lookout. Who was this serious boy who loitered around while the rest of them busted their butts, getting little pats on the head from Mr. Parker like he was a damn puppy nose in the comic book like he hadn't a care? The new men in the kitchen had different kinds of lessons to impart to a young mind, staff they'd learned about the world. Elwood remained unaware that the premise of the competition had changed. When he issued a challenge, everybody in the kitchen tried not to smirk. Elwood was 12 when the encyclopedia appeared. One of the busboys dragged a stack of boxes into the kitchen and called for a powwow. Elwood squeezed in. It was a set of encyclopedias that a traveling salesman had left behind in one of the rooms upstairs. There were legends about the valuables that rich white people left in their rooms, but it was rare that this kind of plunder made it down to their uh, domain. Barney the cook opened the talk box and held up the leather bound volume of Fisher's Universal Encyclopedia, AA to BE. He handed it to Elwood who was surprised at how heavy it was, a brick with pages edged in red. The boy flipped through, squinting at the tiny words, Aegean, Archimedes, Argonaut, and had a picture of himself on the front room couch copying words he liked, words that looked interesting on the page or that sounded interesting in his imagined pronunciations. Corey, the busboy, offered up his find. He didn't know how to read and had no immediate plans to learn. Elwood made his bid. Given the personality in the kitchen, it was hard to think of anyone else who'd want the encyclopedias. Then Pete, one of the new dishwashers, said he'd race him for it. Pete was a gawky, a gawky Texan who'd started working two months prior. He was hired to bus tables, but after a few incidents, they moved him to the kitchen. He looked over his shoulder when he worked as if he worried about being watched and didn't talk much, although his gravelly laughter made the other men in the kitchen direct their jokes toward him over time. Pete wiped his hands on his, hand, on his pants and said, we got time before the dinner service if you're up for it. The kitchen made a proper contest of it. The biggest yet, a stopwatch was produced and handed to Len, the gray-haired waiter who had worked at the hotel for more than 20 years. <clears throat> he was meticulous about his black serving uniform and maintained that he was always the best dressed man in the dining room, putting the white patrons to shame. With his attention to detail, he'd made a dedicated referee. Two 50 plate stacks were arranged after a proper soaking supervised by Elwood and Pete. Two busboys acted as seconds for this duel, ready to hand over dry replacement rags when requested. A lookout stood at the kitchen door in case a manager happened by. 
While not prone to bravado, Elwood had never lost a dish drying contest in four years and wore his confidence on his face. Pete had a concentrated air. Elwood didn't perceive the Texan as a threat, having outvried the man in prior competitions. Pete was, in general, a good loser. Len counted down from 10 and they began. Elwood stuck to the method he'd perfected over the years, mechanistic and gentle. He'd never let a wet plate slip or chipped one by setting it on the counter too quickly. As the kitchen men cheered them on, Pete's mounting stack of dried plates unnerved Elwood. The Texan had an edge on him, displaying new reserves. The onlookers made astonished noises. Elwood hurried, chasing after the image of the encyclopedias in their front room. Len said, stop. Elwood won by one plate. The men hollered and laughed and traded glances whose meaning Elwood would interpret later. Harold, one of the busboys, slapped Elwood on the back. <clears throat> you were made to wash dishes, slick, the kitchen laughed. Elwood returned volume AA to BE to its box. It was a fancy reward. You earned it, Pete said. I hope you get a lot of use out of them. Elwood asked the housekeeping manager to tell his grandmother he was going home. He couldn't wait to see the look on her face when he saw the encyclopedias on their bookshelves, elegant and distinguished. Hunched, he dragged the boxes to the bus stop at Tennessee. To see him from across the street, the serious young lad heaving his freight of the world's knowledge was to witness a scene that might have been illustrated by Norman Rockwell, if Elwood had not had had white skin. At home, he cleared Hardy Boys and Tom Swifts from the green bookcase in the front room and unpacked the boxes. He paused with G.A., curious to see how the smart men at the Fisher Company handled Galaxy. The pages were blank, all of them. Every volume in the first box was blank except for the one he had seen in the kitchen. He opened the other two boxes, his face getting hot. All the books were empty. When his grandmother came home, she shook her head and told him maybe they were defective or dummy copies the salesman showed to customers as samples so they could see how a full sale would look in their homes. That night in bed, his thoughts ticked and hummed like a contraption. It occurred to him that the busboy, that all the men in the kitchen had known the books were empty, that they had put on a show. He kept the encyclopedias in the bookcase anyway. They looked impressive. Even when the humidity peeled back the covers, the leather was fake too. The next afternoon in the kitchen was his last. Everyone paid too much attention to his face. Corey tested him with, how'd you like those books? And waited for a reaction. Over by the sink, Pete had a smile that looked as if he had been hacked into his jaw with a knife. They knew. His grandmother agreed that he was old enough to stay in the house by himself. Through high school, he went back and forth over the matter of whether the dishwashers had let him win all along. He'd been so proud of his ability dumb and simple as it was, he never settled on one conclusion until he got to nickel, which made the truth of the contests unavoidable. On the first day of the school year, the students of Lincoln High School received their new secondhand textbooks from the White High School across the way. Knowing where the next textbooks were headed, the white students left inscriptions for the next owners. Choke, nigger, you smell, each. September was a tutorial in the latest epithets of Tallahassee's white youth, which, like hemlines and haircuts, varied year to year. It was humiliating to open a biology book, turn to the page on the digestive system, and be confronted with drop dead nigger. 
But as the school year went on, the students of Lincoln High School stopped noticing the curses and impolite suggestions. How to get through the day if every indignity capsized you in a ditch? One learned to focus one's attention. Mr. Hill started working at the high school when Elwood entered his junior year. He greeted Elwood and the rest of the history class and wrote his name on the blackboard. Then Mr. Hill, Hill handed out black markers and told his students that the first order of business was to strike out all the bad words in the textbooks. That always burned me up, he said, seeing that stuff. You all are trying to get on education. No need to get caught up with those fools say. Like the rest of the class, Elwood went slow at first. They looked at the textbooks and then at the teachers. Then they dug in with their markers. Elwood got giddy. His heart sped this escapade. Why hadn't anyone told him to do this before? Make sure you don't miss anything, Mr. Hill said. You know those white kids are wily. While the students struck out the curses and cusses, he told them about himself. <clears throat> he was new to Tallahassee, having just finished his studies at a teaching college in Montgomery. He had first visited Florida the previous summer when he stepped off a bus from Washington, D.C. in Tallahassee as a freedom rider. He had marched, installed himself at forbidden lunch counters and waited for service. I got a lot of coursework done, he said, sitting there waiting for my cup of coffee. Sheriffs threw him in jail for breach of peace. He was almost bored as he shared these stories, as if what he had done was the most natural thing in the world. Elwood wondered if he had seen him in the pages of Life or The Defender, arm in arm with the great movement leaders, or in the background with the anonymous ones standing tall and proud. Mr. Hill maintained a broad collection of bow ties, polka dot, bright red, banana yellow, his wide, kind face was somehow made kinder by the crescent scar over his right eye, where a white man has slugged him with a tire iron. Nashville, he said when someone asked one afternoon, and he bit into his pair. The class focused on, U focused on U.S. history since the Civil War, but at every opportunity, Mr. Hill guided them to the present linking what had happened a hundred years ago to their current lives. They'd set off down one road at the beginning of class and it always led back to their doorsteps. Mr. Hill caught on that Elwood had a fascination with the right struggle and gave the boy a wry smile when he chimed in. The rest of the faculty at Lincoln High School had long held the boy in high esteem, grateful for his cool temperament. Those who taught his parents years ago had a hard time squaring him. He may have carried his father's name, but there was nothing in the boy of Percy's feral charm or of Evelyn's unnerving gloom. Grateful was the teacher res rescued by Elwood's contributions when the classroom fell drowsy with the afternoon heat and he offered up Archimedes or Amsterdam as the key moment. The boy had one usable volume of Fisher's Universal Encyclopedia, so he used it. What else could he do? Better than nothing, skipping around, wearing it down, revisiting his favorite parts as if he were one of his adventurous tales. As a story, the encyclopedia was disjointed and incomplete, but still exciting in its own right. Elwood filled his notebook with the good parts, definitions and etymology, Later, he'd found the scrap rummaging pathetic. He had been the natural choice at the end of his freshman year when they needed a new lead for the annual Emancipation Day play. Playing Thomas, and Thomas Jackson, the man who informs the Tallahassee slaves that they are free, was training for the version of himself who lived up the road. Elwood invested the character with the same earnestness he brought to all his responsibilities. 
In the play, Thomas Jackson was a cutter on a sugar plantation who ran away to join the Union Army at the start of the war, returning home a statesman. Every year, Elwood connected and concocted new inflections and gestures. The speeches losing their stiffness as his own convictions enlivened the portrait. It is my pleasure to inform you fine gentlemen and ladies that the time has come to throw off the yoke of slavery and take our places as true Americans at long last. The play's author, a teacher of biology, had attempted to summon the magic of her one trip to Broadway years before. In the three years Elwood played the role, the one constant was his nervousness at the climax when Jackson had to kiss the best girl on the cheek. They were to be married and it was implied live a happy and fertile life in the new Tallahassee. Whether Marie Jean was played by Anne with her freckles and sweet moon face or by Beatrice, whose buck teeth hooked into her lower lip, or in his final performance by Gloria Taylor, a foot taller and sending him to the tip of his toes, a knot of anxiety tautened in his chest and he got dizzy. All the hours in Marconi's library had rehearsed him for heavy speeches, but left him ill-prepared for performances with the brown beauties of Lincoln High on the stage and off. The movement he read and fantasized about was far off, that it crept closer. French town had its protests, but Elwood was too young to join in. He was 10 years old when the two girls from Florida A&M University proposed the bus boycott. His grandmother initially didn't understand why they wanted to bring all that fuss to their city, but after a few days, she was carpooling to the hotel like everyone else. Everybody in Lincoln County has gone crazy, she said, including me. That winter, the city finally integrated the buses and she got on and saw a colored driver behind the wheel, sat where she wanted. Four years later, when the students got it in their mind to sit down at the lunch counter at Woolworths, Elwood remembered his grandmother cackling with approval. She even gave 50 cents to support their legal defense after the sheriff jailed them. When the demonstrations trailed off, she continued to boycott downtown stores, although it was not clear how much of that was solidarity or her own protest against high prices. In the spring of 1963, word spread that the college kids were going to picket the Florida theater to open its seats to Negroes. Elwood had good reason to think that Harriet would be proud of him for stepping up. He was incorrect. Harriet Johnson was a slight hummingbird of a woman who conducted herself in everything with furious purpose. If something was worth doing, working, eating, talking to another person, it was worth doing seriously or not at all. She kept a sugarcane machete under her pillow for intruders, and it was difficult for Elwood to think that the old woman was afraid of anything, but fear was her fuel. Yes, Harriet enjoyed the bus boycott. She had to, she couldn't be the only woman in Frenchtown to take public transportation, but she trembled each time Slim Harrison pulled up in his 57 Cadillac and she squeezed into the back with the other downtown bound ladies. When the sit-in started, she was grateful that no one expected a public gesture on her part. Sit-ins were a young person's game and she didn't have the heart. Act above your station and you will pay. Whether it was God country at her for taking more than her portion or the white man teaching her not to ask for more crumbs than he wanted to give. Harriet would pay. Her family had paid for not stepping out of the way of a white lady on Tennessee Avenue. Her husband Monty paid when he stepped up. Elwood's father, Percy, got too many ideas when he joined the army so that when he came back, there was no room in Tallahassee for everything in his head. Now Elwood, she had thought that Martin Luther King record from a salesman outside the Richmond for a dime 
and it was the damnedest 10 cents she'd ever handed over. That record was nothing but ideas. Hard work was a fundamental virtue, for hard work didn't allow time for marches or sit-ins. Elwood would not make a commotion of himself by messing with that movie theater nonsense. She said, you have made an agreement with Mr. Marconi to work in his store after school. If your boss can't depend on you, you won't be able to keep a job. Duty might protect him as it had protected her. A cricket under the house made a racket. Shouldn't have been paying rent. It had been flopping with them for so long. Elwood looked up from a science book and said, okay. The next afternoon, he asked Mr. Marconi for a day off. Elwood had been out sick two days, but apart from that and some visits to see his family, he hadn't missed work in those three years at the store. Mr. Marconi said, sure. Didn't even look up from his racing form. Elwood dressed in the dark slacks from last year's Emancipation Day parade. He'd grown a few inches, so he let them out and they showed the barest sliver of his white socks. A new emerald tie clip held his black tie in place and the knot only took six attempts. His shoes glinted with polish. He looked the part, even if he still worried for his glasses if the police brought out nightsticks. If the whites carried armed pipes and baseball bats, he waved off the bloody images from newspapers and magazines and tucked in his shirt. Elwood heard the chants when he reached the Esso station in Monroe. What do you want? Freedom. When do you want it? Now. The A&M students marched in snaky loops in front of the Florida, hoisting signs and rotating slogans under the marquee. The theater was showing the ugly American. If you had 75 cents on the right skin color, you could see Marlon Brando. The sheriff and his deputies had installed themselves on the sidewalk in dark sunglasses, arms crossed. A group of whites cheered and taunted behind the policemen and more white men trotted down the street to join them. Elwood kept his eyes down as he walked around the mob and slipped into the protest line behind the older girl in a striped sweater. She grinned at him and nodded as if she had been waiting for him. He calmed once he joined the human chain and mouthed the words with the other, equal treatment under the law. Where was his sign? In his concentration on looking the part, he had forgotten his props. He couldn't have matched the older kid's perfect stencil work. They'd had practice. Nonviolence is our watchword. We shall win by love. A short boy with a shaved head waved one that said, are you the ugly American? in a sea of cartoony question marks. Someone grabbed Elwood's shoulder. He thought he'd see a monkey wrench bearing down, but it was Mr. Hill. His history teacher invited him into a group of Lincoln seniors, Bill Tuddy and Alvin Tate. Two guys from varsity basketball shook his hand. They'd never even acknowledged him before. He'd kept his movement dream so close that it never occurred to him that others in his high school shared his need to stand up. <clears throat> but then the FAMU students would be joined by those from Melvin Griggs Technical, white kids from the University of Florida and Florida State, skilled hands from the Congress of Racial Equality. This day, old and young shouted at them, but it was nothing. Elwood hadn't heard shouted from cars when biking down the street. One of the red-faced white boys looked like Cameron Parker, the son of the Richmond's manager, and the next circuit confirmed it. They had traded comic books a few years ago in the alley behind the hotel. Cameron didn't recognize him. A flashbulb exploded in his face and Elwood started, but the photographer was from the register, which his grandmother refused to read because their race coverage was so slanted. A college girl in a tight white sweater handed him a sign that said, I am a man. And when the protests moved to the state theater, he held it over his head and lent his voice to the proud chorus. The state was playing the day Mars invaded earth. And that night he thought he had traveled a hundred thousand miles in one day. <clears throat> Just 
going to skip a couple of sections not as important as the end of the chapter. Harriet ex expressed no misgivings over Mr. Hill's offer. The word free was a master switch. This was to attend some free classes while being a senior in high school, but at the local college. After that, Elwood's summer moved as slow as a mud turtle. Because Mr. Hill's friend taught English, he thought he had to sign up for a literature course, but even when he found out he could take anything he wanted, he stuck with it. The survey course on British writers wasn't practical, as his grandmother pointed out, but that was its charm. The more he thought about it, he had been exceedingly practical for a long time. Perhaps the textbooks at the college might be new, unscarred, nothing to cross out. It was possible. The day before Elwood's first college class, Mr. Marconi summoned him to the cash register. Elwood had to miss his Thursday shifts in order to attend. He assumed his boss wanted to make sure things were in order for his absence. The Italian cleared his throat and pushed a velvet case at him. For your education, he said. It was a midnight blue fountain pen with brass trim. A nice gift even if Mr. Marconi got a discount because the stationers were a steady client, they shook hands in a manly fashion. Harriet wished him good luck. She checked his school outfit every morning to make sure he was presentable, but apart from plucking the occasional piece of lint, never made any corrections. This day was no different. You look smart, L, she said. She kissed him on the cheek before heading to the bus stop, hunching her shoulders in the way she did when she was trying, trying not to cry in front of him. Elwood had plenty of time after school to get to the college, but he was so eager to see Melvin Griggs for the first time that he set out early. Two rivets in his bike chain broke the night he got that black eye, and ever since, it tended to snap when he took it out for long rides. He'd stick out his thumb or walk the seven miles, step through the gates and explore the campus, get lost in all those buildings, or just sit on a bench of the quadrangle and breathe it in. He waited at the corner of Old Bainbridge for a colored driver who headed for the state road. Two pickups passed him by, and then a brilliant green 61 Plymouth Fury slowed, low and finned like a giant catfish. The driver leaned over and opened the passenger door. Going south, he said. The green and white vinyl seats squeaked when Elwood slid in beside, inside. Rodney, the man said. Rodney had a sprawling but solid physique like a Negro version of Edward G. Robinson. His gray and purple pinstripe suit completed the costume. When Rodney shook his hand, the rings on his finger hit and made Elwood wince. Elwood. He put his satchel between his legs and looked over the space age dashboard of the Plymouth, all the push buttons sticking out of the silver detailing. They headed south toward County Road 636. Rodney tapped vainly at the radio. This always gives me trouble. You try it. Elwood stabbed the buttons and found an R&B station. He almost turned the channel, but Harriet wasn't here to cluck over the double meanings in the lyrics, her explanations of which always left him mystified and dubious. He let the station sit. It was a doo-wop group. Rodney wore the same hair tonic as Mr. Marconi. The air in the car was acrid and heavy with the stuff. Even on his day off, he couldn't rid himself of it. Rodney was on his way back from seeing his mother, who lived in Valdosta. He said he hadn't heard of Melvin Griggs before, putting a dent in Elwood's pride over his big day at college. College, Rodney said. He whistled through his teeth. I started working in a chair factory when I was 14, he added. I have a job in a tobacco store, Elwood said. I'm sure you do. The disc jockey rattled off the information for the Sunday swap meet. A commercial for fun time came on and Elwood hummed along. What's this? Elwood said. He exhaled loudly and cursed, ran his hand over his conch. 
The red light of the prowl car spun in the rear view mirror. They were in the country and there were no other cars. Rodney muttered and pulled over. Alwood put his satchel in his lap and Rodney told him to keep cool. The white deputy parked a few yards behind them. He put his left hand on his holster and walked up. He took off his sunglasses and put them in his chest pocket. Rodney said, you don't know me, do you? No, Elwood said, I'll tell him that. The deputy had his gun out now. First thing I thought when they said to keep an eye out for a Plymouth, he said, only a nigger would steal that. So now we know how Elwood ends up at the Nickel School. Jumping ahead now, there were four ways out of Nickel. One, serve your time. A typical sentence fell between six months and two years. But the administration had the power to confirm a legal discharge before then at its discretion. Good behavior was a trigger for a legal discharge. If a careful boy gathered enough merits for promotion to ace, whereupon he was released into the bosom of his family, who were very glad to have him back or else winced at the sight of his face bobbing up the walk, the start of another countdown to the next calamity. If you had family, <clears throat> if not, the state of Florida's child welfare apparatus had assorted custodial remedies, some more pleasant than others. You could also serve time by aging out. The school showed boys the door on their 18th birthday, quick handshake and pocket change, free to return home and to make their way in the indifferent world, likely shunted down on one of life's more difficult trails. Boys arrived bang up, banged up in different ways before they got to nickel and picked up some dents and damage during their term. Often graver missteps and more fierce institutions waited. Nickel boys were uh, screwed before, during, and after their time at the school, if one were to characterize the general tra tra trajectory. Two, the court might intervene. That magic event, a long lost aunt or older cousin materialized to relieve the state of your wardship. The lawyer returned by dear mom, if she had the means, argued mercy on account of changed circumstance. Now that his father's gone, we need a breadwinner in his house. Perhaps the judge in charge, a new one or the same sourpuss, stepped in for his own reasons, like money, changed hands. But if there had been bribe money, the boy wouldn't have been cast into nickel in the first place. Still, the laws have been cast into nickel in the first place. Still, the law was corrupt and capricious in various measures. And sometimes a boy strolled out through what passed for divine intervention. Three, you could die of natural causes, even if abetted by unhealthy conditions, malnutrition, and the pitiless constellation of negligence. In the summer of 1945, one young boy died of heart failure while locked in a sweat box a popular corrective at that time, and the medical examiner called it natural causes. Imagine baking in one of those iron boxes until your body gave out, rung. Influenza, tuberculosis, and pneumonia killed their share, as did accidents, drownings, and falls. The fire of 1921 claimed 23 lives. Half the dormitory exits were bolted shut and the two boys in the dark third floor cells were prevented from escaping. The dead boys were put in the dirt of Boot Hill or released into the care of their family. Some deaths were more nefarious than others. Check the school records, incomplete as they may be. Blunt trauma, shotgun blast. In the first half of the 20th century, 
Boys who had been leased out to local families wound up dead sometimes. Students were killed while on unauthorized leave. Two boys were run over by trucks. These deaths were never investigated. The archaeologists at the University of South Florida noticed that the death rates of those who attempted multiple escapes were higher than those who did not. One speculates. As for the unmarked graveyard, it kept its secrets close. Fourth, finally, you could run. Make a run for it and see what happened. Some boys escaped into silent futures under different names in different places, living in shadow, dreading for the rest of their lives the day Nickel caught up with them. Most often, runners were captured, taken for a tour of the ice cream factory, where bruises appeared in all different colors, and then ushered into a dark cell for a couple of weeks of attitude adjustment. It was crazy to run and crazy not to run. How could a boy look past the school's property line, see that free and living world beyond, and not contemplate a dash to freedom? to write one's own story for once, to forbid the thought of escape, even that slightest butterfly thought of escape, was to murder one's humanity. One famous nickel escapee was Clayton Smith, his story wending its way through the years. The supervisors and housemen made sure of its longevity. It was 1952, Clayton was not the most likely runaway, not bright or hale, defiant or spirited. He simply lacked the will to endure. Ground down plenty before he stepped on campus, but Nickel magnified and refined the cruelty of the world, opening his eyes to the bleaker wavelengths. If he had suffered all this in his 15 years, what more lay in store? The men at Clayton's family shared a strong family resemblance. Neighborhood folks recognized them immediately from their hawkish profiles, light brown eyes, the flittering way they moved their hands and mouths when they talked. <clears throat> the similarities persisted beneath the skin, for Smith men were neither lucky nor long lived. With Clayton, there was no mistaking the resemblance. Clayton's daddy had a heart attack, and when the boy was four years old, his hand, a claw on the bed sheets, mouth wide, eyes open. At 10, Clayton left school to work in the Manchester Orange Groves, following his three brothers and two sisters, the baby of the family pitching in. His mama's health failed after a bout of pneumonia and the state of Florida assumed guardianship, scattered the children. In Tampa, they still called Nickel the Florida Industrial School for Boys. It had a reputation for improving a young man's character, whether he was a bad seed or simply had no other place to go. His older sisters wrote him letters that his fellow students read to him. His brothers went this way and that, swept up. Clayton had never learned to fight, but with other older siblings around to cow the bullies, at Nickel, he fared poorly in the skirmishes. The only time he felt good and level was when he worked in the kitchen, peeling potatoes. It was quiet then, and he had a system. The house father at Roosevelt at that time was named Freddie Rich, and his employment history was a map of hapless children. Freddie Rich's quarters were up in Roosevelt's third floor, but he preferred to take his prey to the basement of the white schoolhouse in keeping with nickel tradition. After our, that last trip to Lover's Lane, Clayton was done. The two supervisors who caught him crossing campus that night were accustomed to seeing the boy walking back to the dormitory unescorted. <clears throat> they let him pass. He had a head start. The boy's plan involved his sister, Belle, who'd landed at a home for girls on the outskirts of Gainesville. In contrast with the rest of the family, she enjoyed improved circumstances. The people who ran the home were a kindly sort, enlivened when it came to racial matters. The night of his escape, he got to the rim of the swamp, 
where common sense told him to enter the dark water, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. Too forbidding between the phantoms, murk and animal symphony of sex and aggression. The dark had always terrified Clayton and only Belle knew the songs that sued him, cradling his head in her lap as he wound her braids in his fingers while children. He headed east to the edges of the lime fields until he got to Jordan Road. He crept in the woods along the road through the first light and into the afternoon. Every car sent him into the burrs and underbrush. When he couldn't take another step, he hid under a lonesome gray house and squatted in the fetid water of the crawl space. The side of the road was gloomy and fearsome and the boy had no idea about the direction of his travel, but he was unconcerned. Long as he didn't hear hunting dogs, he was okay. As it happened, the Appalachian hounds were deployed elsewhere, attending to the escape of three Piedmont convicts and Freddie Rich didn't report Clayton's disappearance for 24 hours, scared as a trapped rat that his predations would be uncovered. He'd been dismissed from previous jobs and he liked the easy bounty of his latest post. Soon after Clayton started picking at the orange groves, Chet's drive end opened up on a broken stretch of county road. He looked through the slats of the truck on the way to work, waiting for that red, white, and blue explosion of the restaurant's facade and steel canopy. They hung and hung the banners, the signs sprouted along the road to tease, and then it opened. Chet's. True, Clayton had never eaten in a restaurant and overesteemed the grandeur of, of the joint, and perhaps his hamburger, as hunger, nourished the ideas of owning a dining establishment. On the fourth day, he was far enough that he decided to hitch his way. His nickel dungarees and work shirt were a sight. He swiped work clothes from a clothesline after he saw a battered pickup grind away from a big white farmhouse. He cased the house for a spell and snatched overalls and a white shirt when he thought it was safe. He didn't care where his ride was headed as long as it took him a couple of hours distance. Clayton was starving. He'd never gone this long without eating and didn't know how to remedy that, but miles were the most important thing. Not many cars passed and the white faces scared him even if he was bold enough to take to the asphalt. There were no Negro drivers. Maybe Negroes didn't own cars in that part of the state. He finally forced himself to pick, put his thumb when a white Packard with midnight blue trim rounded the bend. He couldn't see the driver, but Packards were the first cars he learned to recognize, and he had a fondness for them. The driver was a middle-aged man in a cream-colored suit. A middle-aged white man in a cream-colored suit. Of course it was a white man. How could it be otherwise in that car? He wore his blonde hair parted and had silver squares of hair at his temples. His eyes changed from blue to ice white behind his wireframe sunglasses, depending on the sun. The man looked Clayton up and down. He beckoned the boy inside. Where are you headed, boy? Clayton said the first thing that popped into his head. Richards, the name of the street he grew up on. I don't know it, the white man said. He mentioned a town Clayton had never heard of and said that he'd take him as far as he was going. Clayton had never been in a Packard before. He rubbed the fabric next to his right thigh where the man couldn't see. It was rippled and yielding. You live there, boy? The man asked. Richards? He sounded educated. Yes, sir, with my mom and pa daddy. Okay, the man said. What's your name, boy? Henry. Clayton said. You can call me Mr. Simmons, nodding as if they had an understanding. They drove for a while, both silent. How old are you, Mr. Simmons asked. They had just passed a closed down Esso station. The pumps rusted to scarecrows and a white church next to a small graveyard. The ground had settled, fending the tombstones off kilter so that the graveyard was a mouthful of rotten teeth. Fifteen, Clayton said. He realized who the man reminded him of, Mr. Lewis, their old landlord. You in school, boy? Yes, sir. It was a Tuesday, he was pretty sure. He counted back. Pretty rich like to look up Saturday nights, cheaper than a dime a dance and you get more for your money. And education is important, Mr. Simmons said. It opens doors, especially for your people. The moment passed. 
Clayton spread his fingers on the upholstery as if palming a basketball. How many days before he got to Gainesville? He remembered the name of Bell's house, Miss Mary's, but he'd have to ask around. What kind of city was Gainesville? There was a lot of this plan he had to figure out before he set things up for himself. Bell would devise secret signals and places to meet that only she knew about. She was smart that way. It'd be a long time before she tucked him in again and told him the things that made it all fine, but he could wait it out if he was close. Hush now, Clayton. That's what he was thinking. When the Packard rolled past the stone columns at the foot of the nickel driveway. Mr. Simmons had just retired as the mayor of the town of Eleanor, but he remained a member of the board at Nickel and kept abreast of the life of the school. Three white students on the way to the metal shop saw Clayton get out of the car, but didn't know that he was the boy who ran away. And at midnight, the fan bellowed its news to the half sleep, but they didn't tell them who was getting ice cream. And in those days, the boys didn't know that cars heading out to the school dump in the middle of the night meant that the secret graveyard had welcomed a new resident. It took Freddie Rich to bring Clayton Smith's story to the student population when he gave it to his least, its latest boy as an object lesson. You could run and hope to get away. Some made it, most didn't. And finally, the short prologue. Even in death, the boys were trouble. The secret graveyard lay on the north side of the Nickel campus in a patchy acre of white, of wild, wild grass between the old work barn and the school dump. The field had been a grazing pasture when the school operated a dairy selling milk to local customers, one of the state of Florida's schemes to relieve the taxpayer burden of the boys' upkeep. Now they had to start the bot. The discovery of the bodies was an expensive complication for the real estate company awaiting the all clear from the environmental study and from the state's attorney, which had recently closed an investigation into the abuse stories. Now they had to start a new inquiry, establish the identities of the deceased and the manner of death. And there was no telling when the whole damn place could be raised cleared and neatly erased from history, which everyone agreed was long overdue. All the boys knew about that rotten spot. It took a student from the University of South Florida to bring it to the rest of the world. Decades after the first boy was tied up in a potato sack and dumped there. When asked how she spotted the graves, Jody said, the dirt, looked wrong. And thus, decades after the closing of the school, as the result, by the way, of a letter that finally our man Elwood had the courage to write and get into the hands of one of the town officials. The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's a fascinating book about fascinating subjects that we prefer not to hear about. And we certainly don't like to read about it and know about it, but it's important. It's so important to the chain of historical events in our country. I suggest you read it. It's 210 pages. It's not very long and it will give you some incredible history. A quick note about next week's book. We go into August next week. We'll lighten our load a little bit and drink iced tea in the shade. We're going to go back to our travel world with our next week's book. We're going to go to a book called The Geography of Bliss by a chap named Eric Weiner. The one paragraph I quote here, what makes a nation happy? Is one country's sense of happiness the same as another? In the last two decades, psychologists and economists have learned a lot about who's happy and who isn't. 
The Dutch are, the Romanians aren't, and Americans are somewhere in between. So we shall travel next week. After years of going to the world's least happy countries, Eric Weiner, a veteran foreign correspondent, decided to travel and evaluate each country's different sense of happiness and discover the nation that seemed happiest of all. So you might want to pack your bags and be ready for next uh, week's reading. And when I get to the bottom line and tell you the happiest country to go to, <laughs> buy the ticket, get to the airport, and make sure you take all of your luggage into the overhead compartment or you'll never get it back. Thank you very much for joining me this week. Uh, the story is a very challenging story, but I think it's something that we all need to be reminded of. Uh, so I'm glad you joined me for it and thank you for staying over time, so to speak. If you enjoyed the video, please press the magic button, like it and consider sharing it with your friends. Also, please feel free to leave a comment uh, or your favorite book or perhaps a comment about this story or the Underground Railroad. Also, I encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel to stay on top of all of the many number of events during the summer and throughout the year. Thank you again for listening to my story today. I hope you'll join me next week and have a good week. Take care of yourself. Goodbye.